All right. So the next kind of big uh, case study or topic I want to discuss is disinformation. Um, so in uh, 2016, in um, Houston, a, a group called Heart of Texas uh, posted about a, a, a protest outside an Islamic center. Uh, they told people to come armed. Uh, another Facebook group uh, posted about a counter protest uh, to show up uh, supporting freedom of religion and um, inclusivity. And so there were kind of a lot of people uh, present at this, um, more people on the, the side uh, supporting freedom of religion. Um, and a reporter, though, for the Houston Chronicle noticed something odd, which he was not able to get in touch with the organizers for either side. And it came out uh, many months later that both sides had been organized by Russian trolls. Um, and so this is something where you had uh, the people protesting were, you know, genuine Americans uh, kind of protesting their beliefs, but they were doing it in this uh, way that had been kind of completely framed very disingenuously uh, by, by Russian operatives. And so when thinking about disinformation, um, it is not, uh, people often think about um, so-called fake news, you know, and inspecting like a single post, is this, you know, is this true or false? Um, but really disinformation is often about orchestrated campaigns of manipulation um, and that it involves, uh, can involve uh, seeds of, of, of truth, you know, kind of the best propaganda always involves kernels of truth, at least. Um, it also involves uh, kind of misleading context and, and, can, and can involve very kind of sincere, uh, sincere people that get, get swept up in it. A, a report came out uh, this fall, an investigation from Stanford's Internet Observatory, uh, where Rene DiResta and Alex Stamos work of uh, Russia's uh, kind of most recent uh, disinformation or most recently identified disinformation campaign. Um, and it was operating in six different countries in Africa. Um, it often purported to be local news sources. Um, it was multi-platform. They were encouraging people to join their WhatsApp and Telegram groups. Um, and they were um, hiring local people as reporters. And a lot, a lot of the content was uh, not uh, not necessarily disinformation. It was stuff on culture and sports and local weather. Um, I mean, there was a lot of uh, kind of very uh, pro pro Russia coverage, um, but that it covered a range of topics. And so this is kind of a very uh, sophisticated phase of disinformation. And um, in many cases, it was hiring hiring locals um, kind of as reporters uh, to to work for these sites. Um, and I, I should say, while well, I've just given two examples of Russia, Russia does, certainly does not have a monopoly on disinformation. There are uh, uh, plenty of uh, plenty of people involved in producing it. Um, uh, kind of on a topical uh, uh, topical uh, issue, there's been a lot of disinformation around um, around coronavirus and COVID nineteen. Um, I. In terms of kind of a personal level, if you're looking for advice on spotting disinformation or to, to share with loved ones about this, uh, Mike Caulfield is a, a great person uh, to follow. And he's even, uh, so he tweets at Holden and then he has started an infodemic blog specifically about the about COVID-19. Uh, but he, he talks about his approach and how people have been trained in schools for 12 years. Here's a text, read it, use your critical thinking skills to figure out what you think about it. But professional fact checkers do the opposite. They get to a page and they immediately get off of it and look for kind of higher, uh, higher quality sources to see if they can find confirmation. Um, uh, Caulfield also really promotes the idea of a lot of uh, critical thinking techniques that have been taught uh, take a long time and you know we're not going to spend 30 minutes evaluating each tweet that we see in our twitter stream it's better to give people an approach that they can do in 30 seconds that you know it's not going to be fail proof if you're just doing something for 30 seconds but it's better to to check than to have something that takes 30 minutes that you're just not going to do at all um, so I wanted to kind of put this out there as a, as a resource. Um, and he has a whole kind of set of uh, lessons at lessons.checkplease.cc. And he's a, he's a professor. Um, and I, uh, in the uh, data ethics course I'm teaching right now, um, I made my first lesson, the first half of which is uh, kind of specifically about coronavirus uh, disinformation. Um, I've made that available on YouTube. I've already shared it. And so I'll, I'll add a link uh, on the forums. Um, if you want, if you want a lot more detail on on disinformation than just kind of this uh, this short bit here, 
Um, but so, so going back to kind of like what is disinformation, um, it's important to, to think of it as an ecosystem. Again, it's not just a, a single post or a single news story that has, uh, you know, is misleading or has false elements in it, but it's, it's really this broader ecosystem. Claire Wardle, uh, uh, First Draft News, who is a, a leading expert on this and does a lot around kind of uh, training journalists and how journalists can report responsibly, talks about the trumpet of amplification. And this is where um, I, rumors or uh, memes or things can start on 4chan and 8chan and then move to closed messaging groups um, such as WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook Messenger, from there to com communi uh, conspiracy communities on Reddit or YouTube, then to kind of more mainstream social media and then uh, picked up by the professional media and politicians. And so this can make it very hard to address that it is this kind of multi-platform. In many cases, uh, campaigns may be uh, utilizing kind of the differing rules or loopholes between between the different platforms. Um, and I think we certainly are seeing more and more examples where it doesn't have to go through all these steps, but can, can, uh, can jump, uh, jump forward. Um, and online discussion is very, uh, very significant because people, uh, it helps us form our opinions. And, and, and this is tough because I think most of us think of ourselves as pretty independent minded, but um, discussion really does, you know, we evolved as kind of social beings and to be influenced by, by people in our in-group and in opposition to people in our out-group. And so online discussion impacts us. Um, people discuss all sorts of things online. Here's a Reddit discussion about whether the US should cut defense spending. Um, you have comments, you're wrong. The defense budget is a good example of how badly the US spends money on the mil military. Um, someone else says, yeah, but that's already happening. There's a huge increase in the military budget. The Pentagon budget's already increasing. Uh, I didn't mean to stop, sound like stop paying for the military. I'm not saying that we cannot pay the bills, but I think it would make sense to cut defense spending. Um, does anyone want to guess what subreddit this is from? Okay. Oh. Unpopular opinion, news, change my view, net neutrality. Okay. Um, those are good guesses, but they're wrong. I love the way you say no. <laughs> um, this is all from, well, it is, um, it's from the um, G, uh, sub simulator GPT-2. So these comments were all um, written by GPT-2. Um, and this is in good fun. It was uh, clearly labeled on the subre subreddit uh, that it's coming in. GPT-2 is a, a language model from OpenAI uh, that was kind of in a, um, a, a, a trajectory of research that many, many groups were on. Um, and so it was, uh, released, I guess about a year ago and should I read the unicorn story, Jeremy? Okay. So if, um, many of you have probably, have probably seen this. Um, so here, uh, and then this, this was cherry picked, but this is still very, very impressive. Uh, so a human written prompt was given to the, the language model in a shocking finding scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote previously unexplored valley in the Andes mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. And then the next part, uh, is all uh, generated by the language model. So this is a deep learning model that produced this um, and the, the computer model uh, generated Dr. Jorge Perez and had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. Perez and the others then ventured further into the valley. By the time we reached the top of one peak, the water looked blue with some crystals on top, said Perez. Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. While examining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered that the creatures also spoke some fairly regular English. Perez stated, we can see, for example, that they have a common language, something like a dialect or dialectic. Um, and so I think this is really um, compelling prose to have been, have been generated by a computer um, in this form. So we've also uh, seen advances in computers uh, generating pictures, uh, specifically GANs. Um, so Katie Jones was listed on LinkedIn as a Russia and Eurasia fellow. She was connected to several people from mainstream Washington think tanks. And the Associated Press discovered that she is not a real person. This photo was generated by a GAN. 
And so this, I think, gets um, kind of scary when we start thinking about how um, how compelling the text that's being generated is and combining that with uh, pictures. These photos are all from this person does not exist uh, dot com generated by GANs. Um, and, and there's a, a very, uh, very uh, real and eminent risk that online discussion will be swamped with fake manipulative agents. Um, to an even greater extent than it than it already has, and that this this can be used to to influence public opinion. So, oh, actually, I guess, it, well, no, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, going back in time to 2017, the FCC was considering repealing net neutrality, and so they opened up for comments to see, you know, how do Americans feel about net neutrality? And this is a sample of many of the comments that were opposed to net neutrality. They wanted to repeal it, um, and it included, I'll just read a few clips. Uh, Americans, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, deserve to enjoy the services they desire. Individual citizens, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, should be able to select whichever services they desire. People like me, as opposed to so-called experts, should be free to buy whatever products they choose. Um, and these have been helpfully color-coded, so you can kind of see a pattern that this was a bit of a, a Mad Libs, uh, where you had a few choices for green for the first uh, noun, uh, and then in uh, orange or, or red, I guess it's as opposed to or rather than. Uh, orange, we've got either Washington bureaucrats, so-called experts, the FCC, um, and so on. And this, uh, this analysis was done by Jeff Cow, who's now a computational journalist at ProPublica doing uh, great work. Um, and he did uh, this analysis um, discovering uh, this, uh, uh, this campaign in which uh, these comments were designed to look unique, but had been created kind of through, uh, through some mail merge style, uh, kind of putting together a, a Mad Libs. Yes? Um, so this was this was great work by uh, Jeff. Um, he found that so while uh, they received the, so the FCC received over 22 million comments, um, less than four percent of them were truly unique. And this is uh, this is not all uh, malicious activity. You know there are many uh, kind of ways where you get a template to contact your legislator about something, um, but. You know, in the example kind of shown previously, these were designed to look like they were unique when they weren't. Um, and more than 99% of the truly unique comments wanted to keep net neutrality. However, that was not uh, not the case if you looked at the full the full 22 million comments. Um, however, this was this was in 2017, which may not sound that long ago, but um, in in the field of natural language processing, we've had like an entire kind of a revolution since then. There's just been so much progress made. And this would be, I think, virtually impossible to catch today um, using, a, you know, if someone was using a sophisticated language model to, to generate comments. So Jess asks a question, which I'm going to treat it as a two-part question, even okay. if it's not necessarily. What happens when there's so much AI trolling that most of what gets straight from the web is AI-generated text? Mm. And then the second part, and then what happens when you use that to generate more AI-generated text? Yeah, so for the first part, um, yeah, this is a real risk, uh, or not risk, but kind of challenge we're facing of uh, real humans can get drowned out uh, when uh, so much text is going gonna, is, is gonna to be um, AI trolling. Um, and, and we're already seeing, and I, in the interest of time, I have... I can talk about disinformation for hours, and I had to cut a lot of stuff out. Um, but uh, um, many people have talked about how kind of the the new form of censorship is about drowning people out, and so it's not necessarily kind of forbidding someone from saying something, but just totally, uh, totally just drowning them out with a, a massive quantity of of text and information and comments and AI can really facilitate that and so I do not have a good solution to that. Um, in, in terms of AI learning from AI uh, text, I mean I think you're going to get systems that are potentially kind of less and less relevant to humans and may have harmful effects if they're uh, kind of being used to create software that is um, interacting with or impacting humans. Um, so that's uh, a concern. I mean, one of the things I find fascinating about this is 
we could get to a point where 99.99% of tweets and fast AI forum posts <laughs> and whatever are auto-generated, particularly on kind of more like political type places where a lot of it's pretty low content, pretty yeah. basic. Um, and the thing is like, if it was actually good, you wouldn't even know. So what if I told you that 75% of the people you're talking to on the forum right now are actually bots? How can you tell <laughs> which ones they are? <laughs> How would you prove whether I'm right or wrong? Yeah, no, and I think this is a real issue on Twitter of, you know, particularly people you don't know of, you know, wondering, like, is this an actual person or a bot, um, I think is a common question people people wonder about um, and can be hard to tell. But I, I think it um, has significance for, um, has a lot of significance for kind of how human government works. You know, I think there's something about humans uh, being in society and having norms and rules and mechanisms um, that this can really um, undermine and make difficult. Um, and so when, uh, uh, when GPT-2 came out, uh, Jeremy Howard, co-founder of FastAI, was quoted um, in, in uh, the Verge article on it. I've been trying to warn people about this for a while. We have the technology to totally fill Twitter, email, and the web up with reasonable sounding, context appropriate prose, which would drown out all other speech and be impossible to filter. Uh, so one uh, uh, kind of... Um, step towards addressing this um, is the need for uh, digital signatures. Oren Etziani, the head of the Allen Institute on AI, uh, wrote about this in HBR. Um, he wrote, recent developments in AI point to an age where forgery of documents, pictures, audio recordings, videos, and online identities will occur with unprecedented ease. AI is poised to make high-fidelity forgery inexpensive and automated, leading to potentially disastrous consequences for democracy, security, and society, um, and proposes kind of digital signatures um, as a means for authentication. Um, and I will say here, uh, kind of one of the one of the additional risk of kind of um, uh, all this forgery and fakes is that it also um, undermines people speaking the truth. And uh, Zainab Tefekci, who uh, does a lot of research on um, uh, protests around the world and in uh, different social movements, um, has said that she's often um, approached by kind of uh, whistleblowers and dissidents who in many cases will risk their lives to try to uh, publicize like a wrongdoing or human rights violation only to have uh, uh, kind of bad actors say, oh, that picture was photoshopped, that was faked, and that it's kind of now this big issue for uh, for whistleblowers and dissidents of how how can they verify what they are saying and that kind of that need uh, uh, need for verification. Um, and then uh, uh, someone you should definitely be following on this topic is Renee DiResta. Um, and and she wrote a great article with Mike Godwin last year, um, framing that we really need to think disinformation as uh, as a cybersecurity problem. Um, you know, it's these kind of coordinated campaigns of manipulation um, and bad actors. And there's um, I think some uh, important work happening at, at Stanford as well on this. All right, questions on disinformation.